Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight, Shalom Oslander, who has exploded on the scene these days. His novels include Mother for Dinner, which was uh, selected by The Economist uh, magazine, as well as a major British newspaper, as uh, uh, one of the best novels of 2021. I want to read to you guys what The Economist had to say. It wrote, and this laugh out loud, gravely serious satire on identity politics, a mother's deathbed presents a solemn decision whether or not to eat her. The, <laughs> the family are cannibal Americans, the most reviled minority in a place where everyone, and quoting here, everyone else was retreating to their cages and calling it freedom, end quote. What the novel asks uproariously do individuals owe, uh, excuse me, what the novel asks uproariously is do individuals, what do individuals owe history? Did I say that right? Yeah. Shalom. Close enough. Did I say it right? Close enough? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and before I, I officially introduce you, I just want our, our listeners to also know <laughs> some of his other novels include uh, Foreskin's Lament. And uh, what does that sound like? Uh, Lament isn't that far from complaint, um, and uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, Beware of God, a collection of stories. Hope, a tragedy. Uh, Holocaust tips for kids. Um, so, uh, to say the least, irreverence and uh, satire are, and, and uh, uh, dark humor are all part of uh, what Shalom Aslander has to share with us. And I will uh, also point out that in the episode notes, I have the link uh, to Shalom's website, uh, which is an experience in itself. Uh, so you can take a look at that. And, um, and with that, Shalom Aslander, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, congratulations on on getting uh, the novel, your, your most recent one, Mother for Dinner, selected as one of the best of 2021 because, you know, The Economist did not list all that many uh, fiction, pieces of fiction as best of the year. But um, but you hit big with this one. Um, talk a little bit about that novel in terms of this. Was there not a point at which and, and I realize that you've, you, you've done <laughs> this was not your first uh, time around, but was there a point at which you were asking yourself, "Are people really going to buy this? Is this is this uh, beyond the pale, uh, or is that really kind of the territory that you seek and you and you swim in?" Um, yeah, I think it is. I don't, uh, you know, I I think it's natural at a certain point uh, or many different points in writing something or putting it out into the world to ask yourself. Um, where's the line? Is this going to piss somebody off or not? Um, but it, to me, it's my job to ignore all that. That's kind of what I'm getting paid for. <laughs> what little paid I get is to just say what I have to say. Uh, and to me, um, life is a black comedy. <laughs> um, and so everything I write does come from there. Um, Voltaire had a great line where he said that, um, that God is a stand-up comedian telling jokes to a room full of people who are too afraid to laugh. Uh, <laughs> I've got that in my collection of quotes. As a matter of fact, I, I collect quotes and that's one of them. Yeah. And that's about as true as thing as anyone ever said. Um, and all the people I've admired, all the people who make me laugh and think are not the ones who either say life is a pile of shit or, life is wonderful. It's the people who say it's both. And that's kind of funny. Uh, and so, you know, with mother for dinner, it came over the course of a bunch of years of different ideas and different thoughts, but essentially, um, it, I, I realized that through this sort of fictional group of people, uh, I was able to talk about and wonder and laugh about a lot of the things currently going on around me. 
You know, you have been um, certainly thoughts of Philip Roth come up when all you have to do is read the book's titles and you think, okay, Philip Roth, I don't know if he was an influence or not, but I remember that when he wrote Portnoy's Complaint, which uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, was about a a young man uh, obsessively masturbating. And he had to go to his parents and say, well, the book was a sensation and really launched his career. But he had to go to his parents and say, hey, listen, I got to tell you, I wrote this book. You're going to start getting phone calls and I want you to be prepared for this. And they thought he had fallen into megalomania only to find out that, wow, the phone is ringing and this is a sensation. Uh, and then I see a, a title like Foreskin's Lament uh, or, or for that matter, Mother for Dinner. Uh, so... <laughs> Shalom, did you have to go to? Are your parents alive and well? First of all, um, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You haven't no. been calling on them. <laughs> no, we, we're we're we've been estranged for many many years. Oh, so, you really have been. Yeah. Oh, um, that reminds me of like an Arrested Development when he keeps telling people that his wife died and they laugh and he was like, "No, yeah, she died." <laughs> wow. Uh, so was it over? Did, was it was because you left the community. The uh, you come from an Orthodox Jewish community. Is that yes, correct? Yeah. Um, and leaving the community was where the estrangement happened, or did uh, your books have anything to do with that? No, or, it wasn't the both? book. Well, I mean, I guess the books were the were the nail in the pine box coffin. But I, it, it was a very dysfunctional family. Um, there was a lot of pain involved. Um, God certainly had. A role to play in that, um, as did the community. Uh, But it's, uh, you know, ultimately it's, it's family. Lots of people from the community I came from are still there and like it. Uh, For me, it was, um, it was a very bad fit. <laughs> Let's just put it that well, way. Well, what do they like about it? Not I talk about the people in the community, not necessarily your parents. What do they like about it? And what was it that repelled you and made you decide, I'm going to take a different path here? Um, well, I, I can't fully speak for them. I've met a few over the years uh, at readings and catching ups. And uh, I think, you know, they have fond memories of it. Um, they like being around their own. Um they like the ghetto ness of it, I think, the shtetlness of it. I think there's, and I think that's what Mother for Dinner is getting at is this tribalism that goes on. Um, that the minute, you know, the minute you love your people yourself, the minute you're chosen, uh, everybody else isn't. Um, and it, it, it automatically builds a wall. Um, and from a very young age, I just, I don't know. I don't know what it was. Uh, if it was simply the family dysfunction that made me want to go away, or if it was the family dysfunction that made me question the values of the family, um, meaning the immediate family as well as the community family, as well as just the entire, you know, uh, American family. To be totally honest, that made me question the things they were they were preaching. So what did it look like when you did break away? Was it, hey, I'm going off to college now, and and guess what? I'm going to uh, maybe not come home, or I'm going to be living a completely different lifestyle? Um, no, I didn't go to college. Um, I I went, I just wanted to, um, uh, I went to like three weeks of Queens College in New York and just ended up selling back the textbooks and spending it on pot and rent and just moved in uh, with my then girlfriend who's been my wife for coming on 30 years now. Um, And we just moved together into a small place and I, I went and got a job. Um, The break was um, very slow and painful. Like, you know, one of those cuticles that you can just never quite get out Mm. um, because it's family and because it's not easy uh, and because it's my past. And because I'm told that, you know, you're the last link in it. 6,000 year old chain, et cetera, et cetera. The same thing everyone's told about their people and their clan. Um, but it became, um, over, it became clear through a lot of very expensive psychiatric help that, um, the family I, the new family I had, meaning my wife, um, was loving and supportive, uh, and made me happy. And the other one made me very sad and was destructive. And the two couldn't, coexist. So I 
I had to make uh, a decision and it started slowly with like, well, I'm going to take a couple of months and let's not have any contact. And in that first few months, I wrote my first short story, uh, which I'd never been able to write before. Um, uh, which was about a guy who dies, an Orthodox guy who dies and goes to heaven and finds out God is like a 30 foot tall chicken. Um, <laughs> who's irate <laughs> at the way chickens have been mistreated. Um, and this guy who thought God was Yahweh can only remember all the chicken soups he's had every Friday night for his entire life. So, and it made me laugh. And, um, and that was the start of it. And it was like, well, I guess that's been productive. Let's make it a few more months. And then, you know, one thing leads to the other and resentments build and, uh, you know, the, the disparity between my current life and my past life was so great that uh, it just, it, it made the decision a little easier. Do you think the fact that you didn't go to college and maybe didn't get into kind of an MFA program or some kind of writing program uh, yes. a assisted yes. in your writing? Yes. Because yes. they would have said, you don't sound like yes. a novelist. You don't, that's yeah. not the way you're supposed to sound. You're supposed to try to imitate F. Scott Fitzgerald. Or, so so yeah. it's almost like Jimi Hendrix and that was never taught the guitar. So he played it upside down. And he started doing things that it's like, wait, yeah. th we don't teach that. Yeah. I mean, a uh, great line from Flannery O'Connor was they asked her if, she thought writing programs uh, ruined writers, and her answer was not enough of them, which I thought. <laughs> funny. Um, and by the way, she's another woman who uh, writer who writes very dark comedy, and everyone says, "Oh, it's so miserable." But she herself, like Kafka, couldn't do readings of her work without without cracking up because she thought they were hilarious. Um, but yeah, I do think that, and I do. I was very lucky to find uh, an editor who. Um, appreciated that about me. And, um, I, uh, I've been with him my entire career. Um, and yeah, I do think that, uh, there is a, a process of, um, of, uh, purification that goes on. You know what I mean? It's like that sometimes the, the, the mix in the mixer, it, the lumps are good. You know, it, it doesn't need to be smoothed out so perfectly. And, uh, I took, what are the lumps when you talk well, about the, the lumps, things that are the imperfections, the, the, that not everything is, is, is ironed out and corrected and smoothed uh, because what ends up happening is everything starts to sound the same. Um, and uh, I find myself reading mostly dead people because um, it's mostly them who wrote for a reason not to be writers, but there's a, there's a, there's something in anything that I like, whether it's music, books, film, poetry, it doesn't matter, comedians, that has a certain um, um, have to have been sadness about it. Um, that you know this wasn't done just to publish a book or to get a Netflix special or whatever, that this person had to say this or was going to die. <laughs> right. Um, right. So it's authentic and it came right from the spleen. Yeah. And I really, you know, and, and ever since, you know, it's interesting talking to other writers who are people who are struggling to write and how, how many voices they have in their heads that I don't have because I didn't go to those places because I don't have an image of a professor saying, you can't say that, or that's not what Chekhov did. Or, um, yeah, look at Fitzgerald or look at whatever. I, I basically just taught myself. I read a lot as a kid. And once I had some access to New York City and bookstores, uh, used bookstores, particularly one in particular on 46th Street uh, called the Gotham Book Mart, I was able to just kind of go and for two bucks, you know, money that I, anything I didn't spend on porn or pot, I was able to buy used books with. And I was like, oh, what's funny? And the guy's like, oh, have you read Kafka? I'm like, no. And so I read Kafka and he's funny. And then that leads me to. And daring. Yeah. Daring. Yeah. And I didn't um, give a shit. creative. And yeah. this, I think I, I had heard you say, I was doing a little background on you and I think it was on YouTube and you were talking about that. Hey, these guys were radical. And today I think you would agree that these are my words, not yours, but it sounds like what you're saying is today there's, there's such timid writing and novels and in the past, 
uh, they were they were uh, out what we would consider outlandish. They were much more radical, yeah. and they said what they had to say fearlessly. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's easy, it's always easy to look back and say that, and you know, nobody knew Kafka in his lifetime, and there, I'm sure there are people out there now doing doing the good hard work that just aren't getting published. Um, but from an industry standpoint, I mean, I sadly I live in Los Angeles now, and it's the same thing with film and TV and music. It, it's very hard to have anything authentic or, and then maybe that's not a problem, you know, maybe that's the same as it ever was, but it certainly feels that way today. Like it, it, that said, I feel like it's such a bummer that people don't read as much because I, I go into bookstores and I'm like, every book in this place is more radical than any movie you're ever going to see. Like, I can't believe they haven't been shut down. <laughs> you know, I don't even talking about Marx or anything. I'm just saying, like, even whatever. It's like there's so much stuff in here that's like not the shit you're going to hear anywhere else. So when I was going through these books, and I do a shelf run on Kafka, and then I do a shelf run of books about the books that Kafka wrote, and they mentioned somebody else, whether it was Beckett or whoever, and then I go and read Beckett, and I'm like, oh, he's hilarious, and then. I would read the books about those books and they never mentioned that. Beckett's serious. He's gloomy. He's a pessimist. Like what the fuck are you right. talking about? This is straight up. This is straight up slapstick comedy. Um, yeah. Uh, People don't understand Laurel and Hardy. that. Though. It's Laurel and Hardy. They even dress the same way. And he loved them. <laughs> he loved Laurel and Hardy. So it's like, it's why it, it's, it's, there's a, um, there's this affectation of seriousness that, and all the great books that I loved and frankly, the, where the novel started with Cervantes, I mean, he wasn't being serious. He was fucking around. The guy was laughing his ass off and people who read the book laughed their ass off. And now it's the Quixote. And now there's Yale courses on it. And you're just like, why do you have to ruin everything <laughs> with this, you know, with this affectation, this deadly seriousness? Um, its purpose is to help us. Its purpose is to keep us sane. We're not the only ones. It's to sh shit stir. Um, and I like shit stirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let, yeah, I wanted to say that one of the things about people who don't read, which is, you know, there's so many people who don't, and, and there's an awful lot of people who, who do read, but only read nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, yeah, if you ask those people, do you like movies or the or, or Netflix series? Almost always they say yes, but the whole difference is, you know. So a director gives you everything; they're they're filling in every detail. They're giving you all the imagery. When you read a book, you actually participate in it. Mm -hmm. When an, an author doesn't, uh, it, the, not any author leaves room for you to visualize the characters and to hear the voices and so on. But it's almost like that laziness of our society that, no, just give me everything. Give me, I'm looking at the boob tube. Give me everything. Don't make me work at all or engage my mind or, or stimulate my imagination. Well, yeah, I, I mean, reading is hard work. It's, it's almost unnatural, um, whereas film and TV are more dreamlike. But, and I'll, I'll happily sit down with my kids and watch something stupid at the end of the day because I don't want to think. Um, but it's when it's that to the exclusion of everything else, it can't, it, it shouldn't all be dessert, you know? Um, and I find a lot of it boring. I find a lot, I, I, I watched two episodes of something everyone says I should watch eight seasons of, and I kind of know where it's going and it doesn't surprise me all that much. And it, yeah, the well, arc is exhausted pretty yeah. quickly. And I mean, I'm a two screen guy. Like I'll be watching something and I've got my phone and I'm like looking at, headlines or what have you that's, or that's checking into some other calling. stuff netflix is calling they're angry there you go they're saying we're <laughs> really not really not that that bad you're watching the wrong series but but the thing is that it, you know they they kind of uh uh i know a series is really good when i put the other screen away and i'm just riveted to, to the tv but there's not very many series like that right uh, let me ask you this though you you've got these uh, historic writers who, well, really the ones you value. Uh, when you read contemporary books, you grew up reading a lot, you said. Do, do you not 
uh, ever fall into the trap of wanting to sound like somebody you've read? Or do you do, are you finding that your own inner voice remains pure regardless of what you're reading? Uh, it depends who. Uh, uh, Vonnegut always makes me want to sound like Vonnegut. Um, so I don't read much of him anymore. Love him. Um, Celine made me want to sound like Celine. You know, lots of ellipses and run-ons. Um, but no, not really. I think what ends up happening is it just doesn't feel real. So it didn't feel like me. So after a line or two, I'll go back and put it in my own words. And that's always been the satisfaction is is hearing that voice, you know, which uh, in childhood is is silenced, um, uh, is often seen as a threat. Um, and in adulthood, uh, isn't encouraged to come out. And that's sort of the joy of all of it, um, is to be able to see that. Uh, the, the books, I, the fiction that most interests me now is usually uh, not from the U.S. Um, there's some really interesting stuff in the Middle East, um, uh, and maybe that's because it's so war torn. Um, but, um, there are some amazing books coming out of Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan and Israel. And, uh, they're funny and dark, um, and about things. Um, they're not, they're not fucking around. So it may just be a question of, uh, a comfort level or, and, you know, we're too, uh, we're too opioided out to give a shit, but, um, there are those people, but their voices don't get in my head as far as writing. They inspire me to keep pushing. Now, do you smoke a little weed before you write? Is that part of your regimen? Do you find that it's that it it uh, helps with oh, the writing, or God, is that I your wish, relaxation? I wish, time? I wish, in heaven, heaven is a place where I can get high and read and write. But uh, <laughs> so you get distracted when you get high. There's two types of people: the people who, when they get high, they, they, their attention becomes very focused. And then there's those like me and maybe like you who become distracted. I don't, I don't become distracted. I write down lots of things and then I look at them when I'm not high and they're just stupid. And I thought they were fucking brilliant. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, the bigger problem was, is- I was, I, mean, I was going to ask you about that because it sounds so profound when you think about it in your own head. And then it's like, I got to, I got to remember that for tomorrow to see if, right. if this really has any profundity at all. Right. No, no one's ever done this. He loves her, but she loves somebody else. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I it, the bigger problem is I, even when I smoke, I, I can't, I can't smoke or drink before a, a writing day at all because I, it, the, the sort of whatever they call it, the whiplash, the, uh, the 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 chemicals in my brain just get so down and foggy the next day that I don't want to write. That um, and I used to think it was because when I was high, everything seemed funny, um, and funny is actually really hard to pull off. Um, and so I didn't want to do the work because oh, I'll just get high and it will seem funny. Uh, but I know I I have read uh, you know all those authors who've been under one sort of chemical influence or another while they worked. Um, and those stories never really end well. And I, I personally always wonder um, what they would have been like without it. You know, what's so interesting is that uh, of the people we just mentioned, Kafka is the weirdest and he was, he was ascetic. I mean, he was vegan. <laughs> you know, He didn't mm. do anything. Um, and the shit that came out was, the craziest probably because of that, because it wasn't being subdued or medicated in any way. It had to come out in its purest form. Um, at least that's what I tell myself. So how do you write? What is your, do you write daily? Is it the morning? Do you, uh, do you use day. a word processor? Do you handwrite? No, all day, every day. I mean, occasionally when I'm super stuck with something, I, I'll handwrite, I'll journal because there's just something about, pen on paper that makes, I think because it's slower or something, it, it, you think more while you're doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, I basically um, I take my young son to school uh, in the morning and then I just hop around from coffee shop to coffee shop writing until uh, three or four. 
So you, uh, okay, so it's pretty much a continuous process. Then in the evening, you might be watching something on the tube and somebody says something or uses a particular phrase and it triggers something, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Or I'll just or I'll just think of something and, you know, I'll write notes a lot at night or uh, at nighttime, I'll usually write the stuff that um, isn't really where my heart is. So I'll write a script that I've been asked to write or... Uh, something that might actually make money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for the bulk of the day, it's very um, just to myself. So you have a voice, an inner voice uh, that you've been using for years. Describe that, your, your voice, your, your writing voice. Um, I don't know that my writing voice is my inner voice. It's a version of it. Uh, it's a crafted version of it. Um, but... Um, there's something um, for me that feels Buster Keaton-ish um, about, about the voice that comes out of me on paper. Um, and uh, I've always loved him um, in a much different way than Chaplin, say, um, or Laurel and Hardy or any of those either. Like, he was just befuddled by the world around him. Um, he was trying to do well, but the world was crazy. Um, and he wasn't particularly, you know, moral person or upstanding or anything. He wanted what he wanted, but he was just stuck in a crazy world and being very straight faced about it, you know? Hmm. Um, and that, that always felt like that's the kind of way I feel I, I'm looking at the world. That's, that's, that feels like the stance I have toward the world. Um, I remember, you know, reading Beckett and feeling that he was doing the same thing. Um, I remember reading Kafka. Mumail Gadara has a really interesting take on Kafka where he says that basically what Kafka did was he just went into the dark depths of a joke. Um, mm. He started with a joke and then he was like, you know, guy wakes up and there's cops surrounding him eating his breakfast and they're arresting him for something he didn't do. Now, that's pretty funny. But then, you know, he takes it seriously. He's like, no, wait, there are cops in the room and they're arresting you for something you didn't do. That's fucked up. Like he's having a, he's having, he's taking the joke that life is and taking it seriously. So that always felt like a certain, you know, Beckett did the same thing. I remember, I remember seeing, uh, this tells you something about the weird child I was, but cutting, uh, cutting school to go see waiting for Godot at Lincoln center when the Irish rep was doing it. Um, because I assumed they would get it right and they did. Um, and it's not wacky, but it's not miserable. Um, the funny thing with, with Godot is that Beckett saw the German one and he hated it. It was too serious because <laughs> it was German <laughs> and his note to the producer was my works are not meant to be ponderous. Um, which is shocking coming from somebody who's there's 10,000 books about how ponderous he is. Um, he didn't see it that way. Um, and then on the other side of it, I remember seeing a video of Steve Martin and uh, Robin Williams doing Godot for Americans. And it's awful. It's just wacka wacka falling down silliness. And it's so God awful. And so for me, you know, Keaton and those writers sort of nailed it. Uh, the writers in print did it. And I felt like that's my worldview. That's kind of how I feel that I'm a schmuck and I'm in a schmuck world. Um, and I'm just trying to make sense of it all. Uh, and so, uh, prose was the way that I could do that, the way I could control it. And I think the hardest part in the beginning was, finding that spot between comedy and tragedy, like where does it live? And that's not a particularly American point of view. Americans, you know, they like their food. <laughs> We're the country that came up with plates for kids that separate your peas and your, your <laughs> and you know, like, um, it wasn't surprising to me that the British papers and magazines and critics were the ones who liked mother for dinner the most because, uh, I feel like here we're, we're, we're very cautious about what we laugh at and what we consider funny and particularly in the book world, um, maintaining a very serious posture about things. 
Now, you uh, uh, were raised in, in Monsey, New York, but you ended up, you spent time in Woodstock. What took you to Woodstock? Uh, well, first, we, I lived in the city for a long time. And we did, my wife and I did the, you know, the typical New York um, move every year to increasingly smaller <laughs> boxes. Um, and we had, I had, after maybe seven or eight years of that, I'd gotten a job that gave me some money and we were like, well, let's go hide it in, in a house somewhere. And we'd been up to a friend's place in Woodstock and went to go look at it and uh, found a place that was just entirely alone. It was just remote. It was up a dirt road. There was nobody around. It backed up on a thousand acres of protected uh, land. Um, so it was there that I was able to start to hear that voice in my head more clearly because I, I am just very suggestible. Maybe I have just low self-esteem, but I, I go to the city and I walk around and I'm like, yeah, I'm working on this book about whatever. And then I see four posters for vampire shows. I'm like, fuck, maybe I should write a vampire book. <laughs> just, I, I succumb immediately to market pressure. So it was really helpful to, to get into the woods away from everything. I, I, even today, I don't do social media. I don't read the news. I, I'm, I'm a very reluctant emailer. Um, and I just try and try and hear, hear my own self. Interesting. Yeah, that's a t tough to do these days. You know, I, I just recently read um, Mel Brooks' uh, uh, autobiography called All About Me. Mm -hmm. And um, he took, you just reminded me of this because he would take what is is out there, what is happening out there, and then he would satirize it. Like he would satirize the, the uh, Blazing Saddle, satirized the, the whole cowboy mm -hmm. uh uh, genre ethos and uh and and then it was uh he uh, hitler he turned into a big joke everybody could laugh about it because he thought that was that was the the best way to um attack who and what he was and stood for and so on um do you have any instincts of that uh, uh sort yourself i mean is that is that part and parcel of of uh, what you have done with some of your books, or or is it something apart from that? Um, I don't know if it's satirizing. I think uh, I don't remember who said it. Somebody once said that um, sacred cows make the best burgers, and I, there's something really important in that because um, I think I think it has more to do with that than satirizing any issues. I think I was raised with a lot of sacred things. Um, God was sacred. Religion was sacred. Uh, keeping meat away from milk was sacred. Um, there were a lot of sacred things that, as the more the older I got, were revealed to be not particularly sacred at all. Um, you know, whether it was the rabbis, you know, groping teenage boys, or um, you know, my father praying in in synagogue and then going home and getting shit faced and you know, hitting my brother and you start to realize that that's not really what is sacred and what is then if it's not that. So I, I think that's, that's more about what it is. I do think that there's, there's, um, there's a, there's a, a certain type of genius in what Mel Brooks does, because again, just laughing at those things is so helpful. And one of the scary things today is that you're not allowed to. Um, laughter. I, I wrote a, a piece for a, a, a British uh, magazine um, that's uh, anti-censorship magazine, um, and it was called Antiha, and it was like about Antifa, but with laughter. And you, you're just not allowed to laugh at things anymore. Everything's everything's measured and um, uh, hyper analyzed, and we just need to laugh. You know, if there's anything that makes me believe that God might not be a complete fucking asshole. It's that at some point during creation, he said, you know what? This place is a shit pile. I better give them laughter. At least the, otherwise they're all going to kill themselves by age five. At least if mm -hmm. they laughter, they can get through it. So to me, it's really critical. You know, you mentioned um, uh, Mel Brooks and um, you know, the producers and Hitler, you know, Chaplin did it 
many, many years before in The Great Dictator. And I always thought, oh, that was just so brave. That was so bold. And then I read a bit where he said later that if he'd known what was going on in death camps and in, and in Europe, he never would have made that film. And I thought, well, that's the exact opposite I was hoping for. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, what we needed that. We still need it. It's still funny. Um, um, there's a, a great review of The Great Dictator by George Orwell. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he basically says it's a god awful movie, but you have to go see it just because this little Jew looks so much like Hitler. <laughs> worth watching. And it's fucking hilarious. Um, and I think that's really important to do. Uh, and, and you know, you, you look around the world and we laugh less or we laugh more timidly and yet tensions are getting higher and higher. Um, and we're reverting back to our tribalistic behaviors more than ever. Um, and laughter whether it's satirical like Mel Brooks or dark humor or whatever, um, or Candide, it's there to to make life a little bit more palatable to go through and at the same time make us all realize that we're all the same. I mean, that's that's the interesting thing to me. Um, and that was what was interesting about Mother for Dinner, that you know when I started to mess around with what the cannibal theology might be, there was this nice insight of, well, you know, Maybe underneath it all, we all taste the same. <laughs> as hard as we try to differentiate ourselves from one another. Yeah. Uh, yeah once it, you, it, you know, it all comes right yeah, back when, down to the same genetics. And yeah. Once you marinate us, blood. once you marinate yeah. us, we're all the same. <laughs> you know, like, uh, ch- chicken's chicken. You know, uh, how it, it's really about the sauce. And so, right, right. you know, that's really, that, that, that was what was so much fun to play with a, a made up sort of culture and history, um, at least, you know, in my head, not in reality, but like to give it some sort of philosophy, um, to make it sacred in the minds of the people doing this thing that we all think is horrifying. Right. Like, uh, any, any alien coming down here, going to a, a, a circumcision will go, whoa, 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 what the fuck are you doing? Um, but the people doing it have a theology. We're finishing God's creation. This is how we take part in our own creation. It's beautiful. Just don't pay attention to the screaming baby and the blood. Right. So well, that, yeah. that's always male best. genital mutilation, right? <laughs> I mean, there, there's people out there now, women out there who say that's male genital mutilation. Yeah. And we're, we fight against that in Africa, but we do it in, right. in the rest right. of the world but, for uh, men. But it's just funny to me that like, that that's what goes on, that we can, I, I, you know, it's less a question of what's right and what's wrong as it is, God, isn't it all just so stupid? Isn't it all when you put it, when, and, and not to be, you know, pessimistic at all. It's kind of an optimistic way of looking at things. Like we're all silly, you know, um, in Mother for Dinner, the main character is, uh, his sort of go-to religion is Montaigne. He's very taken with the writings of Montaigne and Montaigne, you know, did this unusual thing where he sat down in a room and he wrote about himself as unedited as possible and his views of the world um, for thousands of pages. And the conclusion he comes to at the end is even kings sit on their ass and shit. That's that's wiser than anything in the Bible. <laughs> so let me ask you about this comparison. You know, Philip Roth was excoriated by the Jewish community be, for apostasy. It's, I mean, it's, it was kind of crazy at times because it's kind of like, it's almost as if they were trying to tell him, well, you know, Jewish people don't masturbate. Jewish young men don't masturbate. And, uh, you know, Jews do not uh, um, engage in, uh, they, we don't feast on one another and we don't behave this way. Um, do you, I would imagine you uh, get a lot of that same sort of thing. I mean, do, do you have uh, members of the Jewish community who, uh, take exception to, to what you're writing? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hear about it third hand because I don't, I don't read, you know, I'm, I'm not on, I'm not on social media. I'm not, I don't read reviews on Amazon. I don't, I don't even read reviews in legitimate sources of news. Like I, I just, and not out of arrogance, but out of 
sensitivity. I think it would drive me crazy. In the beginning, I did, and it, for Beware of God, the first the first stories I published, I just I couldn't take the, the good stuff. Always had one. It, even in a rave review, there'd be one word that would just set me off. And I was like, yeah, I can't, I can't do this because I can't write the next thing if I'm reading it. But I do know that there's, there was a lot and continues to be, but, um, uh, you know, if you're not, if you're not making somebody angry, you're doing it wrong. Now, are you a theist or are you an atheist or an agnostic? Do you believe in something transcendent or do you think that's all just folly? Um, I'm definitely not atheist in the same way that I can't be religious. I think, I think agnosticism or just not knowing is probably the wisest way that we can be. Um, if only because admitting we don't know, um, is so important to who we are. Um, you know, I was uh, reading Sapiens recently by Harari and, it's a book I really annoyed me, but there's an interesting section of um, that not knowing is what is what made us that that science doesn't know, and that's what allowed us to develop is going from religion, which claimed to know everything, to science, which says we don't know, and not only don't we know, but we're often wrong, um, and that that's a huge step in evolution, in in a step for the better, and whether it's religion or you know, deists or monotheists or polytheists or atheists. And they've all sort of taken their square on the chessboard and they're not fucking moving. Like they know, they know. And I think, you know, a tombstone with a question mark on it isn't the worst way to go. You know, there is the maxim that uh, wisdom is having more questions than answers. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think it makes us humble. I think it makes us less violent. I think we have less to protect. And mm-hmm. it also makes us more open to new ideas. I think the minute you decide, you know, particularly, and the reason it comes up with religion, I think, is because it's completely unknowable. We don't know. And I, I've i spent my life reading everybody from Maimonides to Schopenhauer, <laughs> Spinoza, everybody. Trying who who are trying to find answers to this, and they're somehow make good points, but there is no knowing. And what I always think when I read these things is, why are you so hard up on knowing? Like, right? Maybe not knowing is a good thing for these creatures with these oversized brains and awareness of their own death. Like, maybe the challenge is to not know that that's that's the that's the apotheosis of of humanity is. Uh, <laughs> a shrug. Read the cloud of unknowing. I think it's Huxley. I might have the author wrong, but the cloud of unknowing. I mean, it's uh, yeah. I I agree with with uh, exactly with what you're saying here. Uh, you moved to Los Angeles. Uh, you do screenwriting. So was that did that prompt the move that to be more in the heart of where you we'd be meeting with people and, oh, um, and working with people. No, actually I did. I, I don't do much of it. I did some and the stuff that I did was turned into a series. That was while I was in New York. Uh, the move to LA was uh, a few different reasons. I mean, one, yeah, was might as well uh, be here, but um, we were kind of sick of cold winters and mostly we moved because our Two sons um, grew up in Woodstock, which is this sort of idyllic little rural hamlet, um, which is kind of awesome until like sixth grade. And then it's just another small town America with, you know, uh, opioids and heroin and um, cutting and misery. And we were like, and a great rock concert that yeah, happened, what, in 69? Yeah, time to, that didn't even happen there. Uh, it's famous. No, it was for what? That it didn't was happen Bethel? there. Yeah. Bethel, New York. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was always a perfect metaphor for the town that's famous for something that didn't happen there. But, you know, it's a great place. It's beautiful. But for teenagers, we wanted to be in a more urban place and uh, didn't really want to go back to New York City. And we were like, well, what's urban and warm? Uh, and so we, we picked here. Um, pro- probably should have Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is my notes? My notes here say um, 
that you wrote and created a Showtime television program called Happyish, yeah. which shot a pilot with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. Did that end up? Um, did was it an actual series? Did it get yeah. beyond the pilot? Well, um, my relationship with God being what it was, um, it, the series got greenlit on Friday, and uh, Phil overdosed on Saturday. God, I thought that might have might have been. Yeah. God, so really it was a Friday, he got uh -huh. greenlit, yeah. and then Saturday he OD'd. Yeah. Wow. And we had become very close. I'm writing about it now um, in the context of something much larger. But um, um, it was really devastating because we, over a period of a few years, just became incredibly close and we had very similar dysfunctions and similar families um, and similar relationships with those families. Um, and um, yeah, so that was pretty horrific. Uh, and so, I was so talented. About a year, about a year after that, they, uh, we, we, we restarted it and ended up doing it um, uh, with a new cast and uh, did it for a season. And I really liked it um, and made me laugh. Um, but uh, <laughs> I remember the head of Showtime going, we have a problem with the numbers. I'm like, what, what, how many people are watching it? And he's like, well, um, we have about 400,000. I'm like, holy fuck, that's a lot of fucking people. <laughs> and he's like, no, not for TV. We need a million. It's over. Um, <laughs> I was like, well, wow. you should have told me that. I'm not, I'm not the million type viewer. What the fuck are you doing? Uh, right. Call Judd Apatow. Uh, I, don't, I don't do farts. So, you know, whatever it was, it, it was what it was. And it was actually a really kind of uh, fun experience. Um, but um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't in order to pursue that, that we came here. I, I, I wanted to change. I wanted to get out of a certain mindset that I had in New York, uh, even without going to Northeastern colleges and all that, <laughs> there was a Northeasternness in me that I struggle with. Um and that I thought I might be able to uh, um, get rid of out here. Um, but, you know, they say, you know, you take your baggage with you. Hmm. So check me on this. I have uh, got uh, something for you and actually check Wikipedia on this. It says in 2021, Oslander began a YouTube series titled Ungodly Good Lessons from uh, a Bad God which reexamines the Bible, assuming God, cruel, short-tempered, vindictive as the, as the antagonist of the story, as someone uh, we should uh, never be like. Mm -hmm. uh, done in a chapter and verse format, the goal is to eventually uh, complete the Old and New Testaments. Uh, is that still uh, available? Yeah, that's on YouTube. And is it is our new episode still being created yeah, or, yeah. or not? I'm just they uploading are. a new one tonight. Yeah, I don't do them, you know, very often. I do them, you know, every month or so. Um, they take a lot of work, but um, it's a hugely gratifying um, project. I, I, had, I had originally started to do it in, in prose and just write it straight out like a commentary on the on the Bible, um, um, but doing it uh, in short video form uh, made it a lot more fun. Um, so yeah, and it's basically just going through the stories and the conceit is, you know, when we read the book and, and God is the role model, well, look around the world, like we're just emulating an asshole God. Like he goes to war, he kills his enemies. Um, he really likes money. <laughs> He's awful. And, He's vengeful. And if, yeah. You know, my wife and I have this argument all the time. I, I say that I think you, there's so many people are, are atheists and more of them becoming atheists. And if you look at Islam and Christianity, they both have characterized God as something that, as an example, worship, you know, I created you, therefore you owe everything to me, worship me. Uh, you would have your children taken away if you treated them that way. Right. Child yeah. Protective Services, we take your children away. And yet this is the characterization that we are given of God by the two biggest religions in the world. Yeah. Well, all three. They're all that way. I mean, you know, it, Judaism, Yahweh is a war god. Um, and he's such a dick that that Christians came along and said, oh, OK, don't pay any attention to him. Worry about Jesus. He's a nice guy. He's Smithers. 
that uh, God burns. Um, um, and uh, to me, it's really fascinating because like what, if, if you retell the story of uh, the Wicked Witch of Oz and she's the hero and there's this little fucking bitch, Dorothy, coming into town, fucking everything up, that's a very different story. Um, and you want to be like the wicked person. So it occurred to me, well, what if somewhere along the way, because so many mistakes were made and it was all oral for so many years, what if, stay with me, I know it's a stretch, but what if somehow someone screwed up the protagonist and the antagonist and we've been telling the wrong stories and therefore learning all the wrong lessons. So the story of Adam and Eve isn't don't eat God's apples or he'll throw you the fuck out of paradise. It's don't lose your shit just because your kid took an apple from you. You know, <laughs> any one of these stories flipped is actually a really good lesson. Like, and, and it's full of them. It's full of these wonderful things if you switch the antagonist and the protagonist. So it's kind of fascinating and it gets more fascinating the longer I do it because it keeps getting better. You keep seeing these trends where it almost feels like, holy shit, I started it because I thought it was a funny conceit, but I think I might be right. <laughs> hmm. I think this, I think they got something screwed up here. It's all interpretation. It's all vantage point and all yeah. that. So yeah, and when you go, oh, it's so horrible. Uh, the Inquisition, what they did, like no, that's they did exactly what God does. You know, He created the world. Six chapters later, He's getting rid of it. So if that's who we're admiring, if that's who we say knows all, sees all, and is all wise, well, no fucking surprise that we've got you know nukes and. We're destroying the world and each other. Like, of course, mm. it makes total sense well, if because the story's so fucked up. Right, right. Um, what are you working on now, book wise? And I realize that a lot, a lot of times people don't want to say the title, uh, but can you give us a uh, overview? Yeah, I'm of working, what you're working on, on? Um, two: a novel and a uh, a memoir. Uh, not not quite a follow up to Forskin's Lament, but it's. Um, it actually is dealing with a lot of the things we've been talking about, about the stories that were told as children and the effect that it has upon us um, and what it makes us think of ourselves. So uh, I don't want to say too much about it, but not, not for any other reason than if, you know, I don't even tell my wife stuff because if I do, I stop working on it. Mm. I lose that uh, desire to finish it, but it's, um, it's it's funny, and I think it's also a, a, a an interesting uh, theory uh, that when I do talk to people about it, they go, oh, that's really weird. Why do we do that? Why do we tell horrible stories about ourselves? Because we're horrible people. It's self-revelation. No, that's not true. That's actually not true. We're not horrible. Well, I was only joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, in the eyes of Look, but, God. But, but complete that thought. Piece, what were you going to say? In the eyes of God, yeah, but God's a fucking dick. We should be horrible in his eyes. Um, so it, it's very much this, like, it's this, it's a retelling of stories that I was told in my, my attempt to come to terms with them. And, you know, and, uh, Phil comes up because he, he had similar, similar issues, similar stories. Um, lots of other people in my life. Um, this Phil as in Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. And this whole yeah. move to LA is, is connected to it. So, um, it's sort of a, about a journey through life and wondering, um, you know, how did I, how did I become that person? And we'll, what role did those did those things have to play in it? Do you know when the memoir uh, will be out? Will be no, released? No, not 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 yet. Uh, too early. Too early. Still working on it. But, you know, I, I'm probably the next couple of years. I would hope. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And again, uh, uh, Shalom, uh, congratulations on on all on everything you've done. You've uh, you're quite accomplished. 
Uh, I'm looking forward to future work. I appreciate you coming on the program. Thank you for your time. No, great. Talk to you. Thanks for having me.